Good afternoon. Thank you for your patience as we allowed participants to log into the presentation platform. As a reminder, you can change the size of your presentation and slide windows in your browser. You may submit questions at any time using the Q&A box on your presentation platform. We will now begin with an introduction by Carnegie President Eric Isaacs. Thank you and good afternoon and we're delighted to have you, welcome. Um, so we're delighted today to be coming up on our third year of this virtual science series, uh, which was launched at the start of the pandemic. And it, it turns out that this series has become a real uh, staple for what we do in our outreach efforts in the institution. It enables us to share with you a groundbreaking work uh, with, of our own Carnegie scientists with friends, supporters from around the world. So it's been a great vehicle and we're going to continue to do it. Today, I'm really delighted to be hearing from Peter Driscoll. Peter is a geophysicist in our Earth and Planets Laboratory here in DC, where I'm seated right now. Uh, Peter's research focuses on many things, but some really big questions, such as what makes Earth habitable? How did, how did the Earth form so that it, it can inhabit? How can we be here? Uh, questions like, is the Earth unique? Are there, are there other kinds of uh, uh, livable planets out there, habitable planets out there? And Importantly, and what you'll hear a lot from Peter about is an important part of habitability, which is how is Earth's magnetic field produced <clears throat> and how has it evolved over the billions of years that Earth has existed. It's interesting to understand or note that Earth is the only planet we know of that combines several things, a strong magnetic field, <clears throat> which you hear about today, uh, plate tectonics, the movement of plates, which we all know causes earthquakes and other things, excuse me, and uh, surface liquid water um, for most of the Earth's history for four, almost four and a half billion years. So another question that comes out is what can Earth's complex evolution and complex interplay of these features tell us about the dynamics of other planets, planets that exist <coughs> in our solar system or even outside of our own solar system. So Peter uses uh, large scale numerical simulations, modeling and laboratory analysis of ancient rocks from the Earth and from planets nearby to reveal our own planet's thermal and magnetic history. And it includes many, this history includes many reversals of the Earth's magnetic polarity. And you'll hear a bit about this in his, in his talk coming up. So the way, that, um, the way that the Earth's magnetic fields are generated is the planet does have a, a liquid core. Its outer core is liquid called, um, and the, this liquid moves around and creates a magnetic field. It's called a geodynamo. And this field does, uh, it's very important for life on Earth, it turns out. Um, it, it does uh, shield us from uh, cosmic particles, charged particles, and solar winds, which are constantly bombarding the Earth. So in fact, it's believed that life as we know it wouldn't exist if we didn't have this magnetic field. So it's a very important component of Earth. Many of you will know uh, an effect of Earth's magnetic fields from the um, aurora borealis, which is formed as, uh, as the Earth's magnetic field channels ions, charged particles um, emanating from the sun and uh, in, into various places on Earth, the poles, and that causes, these ions cause various atoms in the Earth's atmosphere to glow, and that's why we get this beautiful aurora borealis. But more importantly, it is important for life on Earth, and you'll hear this in the coming talk. Um, Peter, uh, just a little bit about Peter's background. Peter uh, received his master's degree in physics from San Francisco State University. Um, he was part of the California and Carnegie Planet Search Team when he was there, and he earned his PhD in Earth and Planetary Science at Johns Hopkins. He was a Bateman postdoctoral fellow in geology and geophysics departments at Yale University from 2010 to 2013, and the Planetary Interiors and Evolution postdoctoral fellow in the NASA Virtual Planetary Laboratory at the University of Washington in Seattle. And then he joined us here at Carnegie as a staff member in 2015. So for the past seven years here at Carnegie, he has been doing forefront research on our planet's geological history and an important part of a team here at, the, at Carnegie that's doing work to really have a comprehensive understanding of our planet, uh, how it's evolved, how it works, but also how our planet ultimately was able to support life in a sustainable and long-term way. So without any further uh, ado, please join me in welcoming Peter Driscoll. Peter? Okay, thanks, uh, Eric. That was a terrific introduction to go through many of the things I'm going to talk about. So let's get right into the topics 
So I'll start with the sort of the, the burning question that most people have in mind is what, why are magnetic fields important for us as living beings and what does it mean for the habitability of other planets? This is probably the hardest, as you can imagine, topic to cover. There's a lot we don't know, um, but I'll give a quick outline and then I'll talk about the prospects of detecting um, Earth-like magnetic fields or non-Earth-like magnetic fields around other planets on the search for other Earth-like planets. And then I will get down into some conceptual ideas about how the magnetic fields actually generated. This gets into my own research. Um, and then I'll do a research vignette at the end that's surrounded with this, um, by this idea that the geodynamo, the Earth's magnetic field, may have recharged or sort of re restarted at some point or got a boost at some point in its evolution. Uh, and that'll be the uh, last topic. Uh, hopefully I get there. Okay, so this image which was created by uh, somebody here at Carnegie a couple of years ago is one I like to start with. It's, of course, uh, not particularly accurate or to scale, but it gives you the sense that the, the Earth's magnetic field uh, is the first barrier to the interstellar environment. So charged particles, whether they're coming from our sun or from interstellar space, uh, get deflected around the Earth's magnetic field at a, at a particular radius known as the magnetopause radius. This can move depending with solar solar storms. But the interesting point is that this point, which is very far from Earth, about 10 radius away from Earth, is uh, its generation is responsible for activity that's going on in the center of the planet, effectively, at its core. This magnetic field permeates through the, the rocky mantle and all the way up into space. And so it's, it's absolutely critical that we understand what's going on in the centermost part of our planet, which is also, of course, the hardest to access. Um, so the, the idea uh, behind how magnetic fields influence planetary surfaces is that a strong magnetic field um, will provide a, a magnetopause barrier that's way above the top of the atmosphere. And so most of that uh, neutral atmosphere is not interacting with the space environment. And as you weaken that magnetic field or perhaps have no magnetic field as the image on the right um, shows, then you're allowing these solar wind particles to interact directly with the atmosphere and potentially ionize it and, and uh, erode it over time. And this could have happened to Venus, which has no magnetic field today and is missing lots of water. Um, we don't know exactly, but uh, that's one of the leading ideas. And so we think that this is a general idea we can apply to exoplanets. And so for that reason, magnetic fields are considered one of the main habitability features, uh, as Dr. Isaacs pointed out. Um, and this diagram illustrates from a paper we published in Science a couple of years ago, where you have um, the magnetic field generated in the core, the outer liquid iron outer core. Um, and to generate that magnetic field, you need to cool the core, which is done by convection in the mantle. We'll get more into the details in a bit later. Um, but you can imagine a, an exoplanet that doesn't have this kind of cooling, convective cooling feature, maybe, maybe doesn't have a magnetic field. And so we, we made this statement in this article that Earth's interior maintains a stabilizing feedback between the hydrosphere, that is the water and the atmosphere, mantle and core that's important for long-term habitability. And then now I'll zoom out a little bit to, to, to give you a sense of how common planetary magnetic fields actually are. Now, I said Venus doesn't have one, but almost every other planet does. So on the left here is magnetic field intensity at the surface versus the uh, on the x-axis, the mass of the planet or, or sun in this case, just to show you that there's a, you know, a general trend with mass, but there's a lot of scatter. Um, and the magnetic fields are all, all different kinds of morphologies. So different kinds of tilt with respect to the planetary rotation axis. Earth's magnetic field axis tilts about 10 degrees. And of course that tilt can change over time. Jupiter and Saturn are very axisymmetric. Uranus and Neptune are very not axisymmetric. They're kind of tilted. Um, and you can have non di these are all dipolar fields. You can have non-dipolar fields as well, which we'll get to at the end. And the other thing to note here is that we've essentially got two or three different classes of dynamos when we look at the solar system. We've got iron-rich cores, which the Earth falls into, 
where it's molten iron convecting that's generating the currents and the magnetic field. And then uh, on the gas giants and the ice giants, you've got ionized hydrogen either by, you know, as it's as it ironites by itself or with some other species like carbon or nitrogen um, that can form a conductive fluid or gas in their interior that when it's convecting will generate a magnetic field. So Mercury has an active dynamo today, as does Earth, Ganymede, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Venus, we have no measurements of it having any mag internally generated magnetic field today. That doesn't mean it didn't have one in the past. We have no evidence. We have evidence of the moon. The moon's crust is magnetized, so it likely had a, had a dynamo in its core in the past, as well as for Mars. So that gives you a sense of some dynamos live for four and a half billion years and some don't. So we've now seen that basically every planet except one or two has a magnetic field, um, but they're all different in, very, in a lot of different ways. So why, why is magnetic field ubiquitous in the solar system? And that's because there are generally only three ingredients. First, you need a large volume of electrically conducting fluid, as we said, could be iron, could be hydrogen, could be something else. Uh, two, you need rotation to get the to generate the currents necessary, and this is actually the easiest of the three requirements because everything in the universe rotates to some degree. And third, the hardest constraint is you need an energy supply, so you need something that's going to move the fluid uh, to get it moving, to get it convecting, and the most common. Um, form of that is through cooling. Cooling the planet, uh, if you cool it rapidly enough, it's going to cause the fluid to move. Um, and of course, why is there such a diversity in different magnetic morphologies and magnetic evolutions is a lot harder to answer. That gets more down into the details of each planet and how they evolve. So from a big picture, here's how I think about investigating planetary magnetic fields. We have the observations on one hand, which come from uh, well-preserved rocks on the Earth's surface or on other planets that have locked in a magnetic field. You can have space probes, and then, uh, which is a direct measurement from space. And then we can have radiometry, and this is a, a, an indirect measurement of radio emission coming from a planet, planet's magnetic field. On the other hand, we have uh, centuries of fluid dynamics, theoretical fluid dynamics, to understand how fluids behave uh, when heated and when they are highly conducting and they generate magnetic fields. This is called MHD, magnetohydrodynamics or dynamo theory. And nowadays we have large um, laboratory experiments and numerical simulations, which I'll, I'll show you a little bit of. Um, and putting these, um, all of these things together to form a planetary model is really um, the end goal where you, you bring in all the constraints you have to best understand what's going on in the deep interior and how things evolve so that you can then apply it to other planets, whether they be real or hypothetical. So I wanted to touch briefly on the historical connection with our department here. Uh, at the Carnegie Institution in Washington, we used to be known as the Department of Terrestrial Magnetism for about 120 years. And um, back in 1955, um, two young staff scientists at the time decided to um, get some money together and build a radio telescope out in a farm in Seneca, Maryland, which is about 20 miles northwest of where I am now. Basically, they just strung wires on telephone poles across the field in a very particular way and hooked them up to um, sensors so they could detect um, radio, long, free, long, long wave like radio waves as they pass through um, the cables into the Earth. And they had no way of pointing this so-called telescope, so it was just looking straight up at the sky every night. And after uh, several months of observing, they realized that they had a signal, a rep repetitive uh, long wavelength radio emission coming from Jupiter. And at the time, in 1955, we didn't know much about Jupiter, um, but they published this paper that attributed this radio emission to, in fact, magnetic cyclotron emission coming from the magnetic field on Jupiter. So all you need is some ions, protons, trapped by the magnetic field, and they will produce this kind of radio emission. Uh, and so this was actually the first detection, remote detection of a planetary magnetic field. There still exists a plaque down here in the bottom right. You can go see it up on uh, River Road. And of course, they, they, they admit that this was a bit of a, a luck 
our identification of Jupiter as a radio source is not based directly on reasoning, but more on luck. They were in fact looking for uh, nebular features, I think. But this started a whole field of um, radio cyclotron emission detection. And here, if I can get this movie to show, this is just um, a, an image of Jupiter rotating and then superimposed at the pole is what the, uh, is, is the aurora, uh, which is visible. And then associated with that aurora are these radio emissions that uh, Franklin, Burke and Franklin were actually detecting. And here's another um, animation in the bottom right of the aurora and the, where the radio emission would occur on the Earth. So these magnetic emissions, as I've, as I've mentioned, occur because you, you have got uh, charged particles around that get trapped around the magnetic field and spiral down. So this idea, oh, and by the way, with Jupiter, we've got good enough data. We can see Europa, Ganymede, and Io, which are, are provide ions um, into Jupiter's magnetosphere. So we expanded this idea to exoplanets back in 2011. Um, and you can ignore the equations here. They just describe how the frequency of the emissions related to the magnetic field. So if you see a planet emitting at a particular frequency, in this frequency band, then you can um, back out the magnetic field strength, which is super useful. The trick is what's the power of that emission, which is on the y-axis of this plot. And this plot shows you emission, theoretical, hypothetical emissions from Earth-like planets around Alpha Centauri or GJ876, and then Earth around Alpha Centauri and Saturn around Alpha Centauri and so forth. Um, there's two bad things about this plot that we still have not resolved. The first is that to the left of 10 megahertz, south of 10 megahertz, our Earth's ionosphere filters out most of the radiation. And so you really need to get above the ionosphere or go to the poles where the ionosphere cutoff is at lower frequency to see these Earth-like emissions or low planet mass emissions. Uh, the other problem is that the largest telescope, radio telescope we have, which is LOFAR, um, gives us a detection threshold in the upper right of this image. And so we, we're no, we don't really have the fidelity right now to push down to, um, you know, rocky planet type magnetic fields. In fact, the targets are these hot Jupiters expected to emit much stronger. None of those have been detected to date. And so the next generation of missions are being in the works of being proposed now. There are two that I'm most familiar with. First is called Farside out of the University of Colorado, where they, they propose to put a, install a large uh, radio telescope on the, surf, on the backside of the moon, which is a very radio quiet location. Um, and they fan out these little radio antennas out in this flower petal type of uh, way. The other idea is to fly hundreds or thousands of little CubeSats, these little cubic uh, satellites, up in a, a particular pattern up in space and have them point towards your target. Um, and so you basically have a flying space telescope in this sense. And those are really probably going to be what's going to be needed to, to detect Earth-like magnetic fields in the future. And this is probably a decade or more down the road, but at least people are thinking about this now. Okay, so we started way out in space, and now I'm going to bring you back down to Earth. Now we're going to look at what we know about the Earth's magnetic field, which is we know the most about any magnetic field. It comes from the Earth, of course. Um, back in the 1880s, Gauss was the first one to make a local measurement of the strength of Earth's magnetic field, and that, would, um, that was then measured at magnetic observatories around the world. And you can see from this plot that the intensity in black, maybe I can draw here, uh, the intensity in this black line here has been decreasing over the last uh, couple hundred years, much quicker than a magnetic field would decay if you just left it alone three lead to three decay, which tells you something's changing the magnetic field faster than it just decay, which means something must be generating the field much faster than it um, is also decaying. So something's just changing the magnetic field in general. Um, the, the magnetic field pole is also wandering in space. So here it is over um, Greenland, I believe. Um, and you can trace it back, you know, um, just kind of wiggles around the pole over time, over the last couple hundred years. We know the magnetic field is reversed, and I'll get to that in a minute. And here is a movie that um, 
hopefully play is, is a little slow. It's a movie of the magnetic field uh, at the core surface. It's projected down to the core mantle boundary over the last um, 10,000 years. And so the main feature to notice here is that um, you've got mainly two poles. You've got blue or downgoing magnetic field in the northern hemisphere and red or pink or upwelling um, magnetic, magnetic field in the southern hemisphere. Um, and that's the feature of a dipole. And the zero point is close to the equator here. That's what this um, wiggly line here is. But it's not a perfect dipole. That's the other thing to notice. It's not a simple dipole. There's other little features in there, non-dipolar features, and they change on decadal to century, you know, to thousand year millennial timescales. So to us, this is slow, but over the course of billions of years, you can imagine the Earth is, the dynamo has gone through many, many changes over time. Okay, and I'm gonna stop this video. That goes on for a few minutes. Um, we know we have uh, an ancient magnetic field because as rock, when rocks are hot, the magnetic carriers can, uh, um, and then that rock cools down, the magnetic carrier, carriers will align, like the iron crystals will align with the ambient magnetic field at the time, which is the Earth's magnetic field. And if that rock stays cold for long enough, um, then you can look at the, the Earth's ancient magnetic field in that rock. Presumably you can, if you can tease out uh, how that rock has moved over time which is an extremely powerful technique that's called paleomagnetism, paleo referring to ancient. Um, it's a little complicated because you need to know where your rock was on the surface of the earth, because of course the magnetic field direction depends on where you are and your latitude. And you also need to assume that the magnetic field itself was, you knew it's morphology. So you know it's a dipole, like it's diagrammed here. So that's called a, the, a dipole, a geocentric axial dipole assumption that's built into a lot of paleomagnetism. Um, the sea, the Earth's seafloor um, has a pristine record of what's so-called magnetic stripes. And this was key to unlocking um, uh, the idea of plate tectonics and that the, the plates have actually moved over time very slowly. So if you tow a magnetometer beneath a ship, like during World War II, looking for submarines, uh, you, you would get a faint signal, wiggle on the signal as you moved away from the mid-ocean ridge. And if you patch those up with all the ridges all over the world, then you see that um, there is this pattern of northern and then southern and then northern orientation of those magnetic sediments or mag magnetic rocks in the crust, um, which give us an idea of, um, well, first it shows the magnetic field has reversed and it shows you how frequently it has reversed. Uh, and if you could back out some of, something about the age of these rocks, then you can get some sense of how fast the seafloor is spreading, which is also critical to understanding how the Earth has evolved. And here's a more detailed picture now. I'm showing the last five reversals. The last reversal was 780,000 years ago. Um, and that's when the, and, and at that time, we know that the intensity of the magnetic field was extremely low. And we, now we think that the, the intensity gets very low, right, when there's a reversal. And then after it reverses polarity, the intensity climbs again, and it's sort of a coupled process. So we know that this, these reversals have occurred thousands of times over the last couple hundred million years, and we think there is some kind of periodicity to that reversal rate. So here you're seeing um, the reversal rate, the magnetic field reversal rate per million years. So presently we're at about four reversals per million years, and that reversal rate decreases as you go back to the Cretaceous normal supercron, where it goes to down to zero for a while, for 40 million years, then it climbs back up, then it goes back down. And this cyclicity in the reversal rate is actually not a, not driven by the dynamo itself. It's likely uh, that time, that 100, 200 million year time scale is likely a feature of mantle. Something's going on in the mantle, like uh, um, a subduction cycle or a supercontinent cycle or something. Uh, it's causing the, co the core to cool more quickly when it's reversing and less quickly when it's not reversed. That's our current understanding. Okay, now I wanna to get to a, this topic of the intensity over time, which is gonna to lead to the vignette I'm gonna to get to at the end, my own research, is when we look at the intense, the magnetic field intensity from rocks of the geodynamo over the last two billion years, say, um, the intensity is very scattered. It's all over the place. So the, the red 
uh, come from high quality basalt type rocks. The blue come from other types of metamorphic and sedimentary rocks. But um, if we kind of do some quality filtering and do the, get the best data we get our hands on, you get um, a time series that looks like this. And the black line here, this black line, um, is just a smoothing average of the data. And the gray just indicates that uh, standard error, standard deviation. So if you look at this plot, you would say, um, maybe the, the magnetic field intensity has, sure, it's fluctuated quite a bit by a factor of maybe two or three from its mean, but there's no long-term, obvious long-term trend. It's not decreasing, it's not increasing. There's no big bump anywhere, um, which is interesting because we think in the last 2 billion years, certainly the core, the core has cooled down. That would be strange if it hasn't. But we also expect the inner core, the solid most part of the earth, uh, solid iron in the, in the middle of the core to have first formed somewhere in this time frame. And when it nucleated, you expect it to change the magnetic field because it releases some energy when it does. And so that's the research vignette I'm going to get to. When did the inner core form? Is there any evidence? And what are the implications of that? And this would be nice because if we could pin down the age of the inner core, that is when it first solidified, it would give us the temperature at the center of the Earth at a given time which would be a very valuable constraint on the thermal evolution of the Earth. So to, to actually try and pin down the age of the inner core when it first nucleated, we're going to use some numerical dynamo models to investigate what the magnetic field would, how it would change in response to the nucleation of the inner core. And so you can imagine, um, you may know this from introduction to physics, that if you take a charged particle in orbit, it generates a magnetic field put a charged particle in orbit, generates a magnetic field. Um, now in the Earth's core, we don't have particles necessarily. We have fluids, charged fluids with free electrons. And because the Earth is rotating and the, the fluid is very low viscosity, you expect it to form these convection rolls um, that are almost like a, a tornado. That's It's like a cylinder. Uh, and the whole thing is rotate co-rotating together. Of course, it's a little bit more complicated than that. And I'll show you a movie here this shows up, of um, what, the, what the magnetic field looks like in the equatorial plane from one of my numerical dynamo models. Okay, now it should show up. Just to give you a sense of how complex the, the actual convection of magnetic field looks uh, can be in the model. And um, it's important to understand that there's two ways to drive convection in the core. So before the inner core nucleates, we need to drive thermal convection, just cooling of the core, drawing heat out that way. And once we cool the core down enough, believe it or not, the, the liquid iron will start to solidify at the center, and that's a pressure feed freezing effect. And when it freezes, you're releasing energy at the inner core boundary because light elements are, are rejected from the solid and they're immediately buoyant when you drive convection. And maybe today we have both thermal and chemical convection going on. And this leads to one more conceptual point I wanted to make about the planets. And this is my so-called Goldilocks cooling rate. So you can imagine that a planet that cools, um, that has a low cooling rate, uh, low QCMB, uh, maybe drives um, thermal convection for a little while here on the left. Uh, and the magnetic field maybe dies eventually because it stops cooling. The planet's not cooling fast enough. So that could be Mars, that could be Venus. And you can imagine if the core is cooling too fast, on the right here, uh, you've got a thermal convection component here. Then the, maybe the inner core nucleates at some point because you're cooling the core real quickly. And that gives you a boost to the intensity. But then you're cooling so fast that the whole core solidifies and you can no longer generate magnetic field. And we have some hints that maybe the moon went through this kind of double peak event uh, and then died. And then on the Earth, where you're kind of right in the, in the sweet spot, you have you can undergo the thermal cooling and then the inner core nucleation, but everything is drawn out in time. So you're cooling it fast, but not too fast, and you can generate a magnetic field for billions of years. So I would put Mercury and Earth in this uh, medium cooling category. And my daughters, of course, drew on my uh, AGU poster here with the Goldilocks bowls in case um, you needed another visual there. Okay. So here is my model 
for how the magnetic field influ is influenced by inner core nucleation. I'm not going to go through all the details here, but I needed to, the first thing I needed to do is to get the cooling history of the core right. And so I applied these constraints from the mantle, cooling constraints on the mantle, to get this cooling evolution of the core. And then if I use a simple dipole scaling, I get a very simple, this black curve here, which predicts a bump, a boost in magnetic field intensity around 650 million years ago when the inner core is predicted to have nucleated. But this does not agree with these paleo intensities, these gray dots here. And so I was not happy with the scaling law. Um, most people weren't, this is a fairly common problem. So what I did was I took this core power history from my 1D model and I applied it as a boundary condition on 3D dynamo models. So now my dynamo models are evolving thermally over time and I grow the inner core slowly. And here's an image, here's a, um, an animation from one of these convection models um, where you can see the temperature evolving on the right, so it's hot on the interior, and then cooler as you get out, and then the magnetic field that's generated, which is very complex. Um, but we want to focus on the magnetic field at the Earth's surface that you get out of this model, and mostly what you see is the dipole. So here is the dipole moment from this model over 2 billion years. So we start over here on the left. The magnetic field increases for a bit, um, and this is all thermal convection until the inner core nucleates around 650 million years ago. And this is the big change my model predicts. But before the inner core nucleated, maybe I'll draw a little bit here. Before the inner core nucleated, my models predict that the dynamo was in a, a very weak state with a very non-dipolar uh, magnetic field, as you can see on this time average snapshot here. And then when the inner core nucleates, it pushes the dynamo up into a strong field branch and you get a dipolar, stable dipolar magnetic field for the last five billion years. And here's a couple more movies. Uh, the first one is just prior to inner core nucleation in the model where the magnetic field is very unstable and is weak. And so it's not a dipole here on time average. So if you go to look at rocks from this age, I project, predicted that you would not see a very well-behaved magnetic field. And recent observations have come back to support that um, hypothesis, which is exciting. And then the second movie, there it goes. This is the, mo the modern day model of the dynamo, which is a much more stable dipolar uh, morphology. Okay, and then um, to wrap, and then if I can skip to the next slide, there we go. So I have to stop this movie. Okay, okay, so the next slide here shows a comparison of um, the data, again, the black line is the smooth data product. Um, and then the green, the squiggly green line is my evolving numerical model. And so I would first, my first takeaway from this comparison here is that these don't agree. I don't think, it's not like I think this problem is solved. But I do want to draw your attention to this period of time where there's only a handful of paleo intensity data. And I've suggested that maybe there's a lack of intensity data here because every time someone samples a rock from this age, it could be behaving so poorly that they think the rock is not well preserved. And so they don't give that paleo intensity much credence. And so people are going back into the field. I should also say, you know, it's very hard to measure such weak intensities. And so people are going back into the field to measure rocks from this age to see if they can pick out um, anything in this period, whether it agrees with my models or not, it'd be good to fill out uh, this part of the um, time sequence. And there are many implications here. I don't have the time, time to go through all of them, but as I mentioned early on, if you have good paleomagnetic data, you can infer the latitude of your continents back in time, of the rocks, effectively. And if you do that all over the globe, you can infer the locations of continents and how they've moved. So this is called paleogeography, how the, the continents on the Earth have moved over time. And doing that, playing that game, we've come up with the idea that around this time in the Neoproterozoic, between 500 and 700 million years ago, uh, the plates were moving ridiculously fast, kind of running across the Earth's surface so fast that it's not possible. There must have been something funny going on, like the whole crust was rotating quickly for some reason. Um, 
or maybe the plates are moving or there's something going on. And there's also these snowball events where people think they see um, um, tropical uh, rocks with layered with um, ice um, ice covered rocks. And they infer that to mean that the whole globe is covered in ice. But if the paleo uh, latitudes are off, then these some of these inferred snowball events could actually be more like mid latitude events, you know, major climactic events, but not the equator to pole type of snowball events um, that some, that have been proposed for some of these uh, time periods. So the takeaways from this research vignette is that, like people, we think dynamos likely go through phases. We know the sun goes through magnetic phases. The Earth's magnetic field obviously has gone through many reversals, but it may have gone through weak field stages where it was completely different type of magnetic field. Of course, we need more data to constrain both the thermal evolution and the magnetic history of the Earth, and it'd be great to really couple the two. It's a really strong um, way to solve to come at the problem. Um, and these non-dipolar magnetic fields that I predict in the Neoprotozoic really complicate the tectonic and potentially the climate history at that time. So I'll wrap here and be happy to take your questions with a short summary. So I hope you learned that dynamos are cool, they're ubiquitous, they're complex. Um, we can use planetary models to connect the various aspects of fluid dynamics with the observations. Uh, it's good to be right in the middle with a planet that's cooling not too fast and not too slow. Um, my best guess for the age of the inner core is about 600 million years. Um, uh, and I didn't get much into super Earths today, but maybe in the future we'll be able to get some magnetic radio detection and start to map out what some of these other planetary and magnetic fields look like and see how unique Earth really is. So I'll leave it there and uh, toss it back to Eric. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. That was uh, that was great, um, and it was definitely cool. So I'll give you that. It's cool <laughs> and complex. Um, we had a lot of great questions. I'll try to, as I said, I'll try to put them together and, and give you some uh, um, sort of summaries of them. Um, there's a whole group sort of of, of origin of, of, you know, the core and how these magnetic fields started and then what kind of externalities could have affected them. And as you just said, 600 million, 600 million years after formation of the Earth, the, 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 the core, or 600 million years ago, the core formed and that's when you started seeing these effects. But can you say a little bit about some of the dynamic and how it formed um, in, in the beginning. I mean, so how might it form on Earth? How might it form other planets like Jupiter where you see it um, from the early stages of say protoplanetary, um, proto protoplanets, how the dynamo. So goes. yeah, I mean, the, the, the rocky planets and the gas giants are sufficiently different. I wouldn't put them in the same category in terms of how their core formed or how their dynamo started. The Earth, we, we think that um, you know, after the last giant impact that formed the moon, that the, the core and the mantle separated uh, because iron uh, is denser than silicates. Um, and that, that set the stage for, the, that really is the initial condition for the thermal cooling models that I compute, where you have the, the mantle, which is very viscous, cools the core very slowly over time. So initially, the core is thought to be very hot, maybe 5,000, 6,000 Kelvin. And then the inner core, uh, and there's no inner core initially. It's all the core is all liquid. And then, as I said, when you cool the core down to about 4,500 Kelvin, 4,300 Kelvin, that's when you expect iron to nucleate at the center. And we really don't know when that happened. You know, my best guess is 600 million, but other people's guesses are 2 billion. And it depends on very poorly known constraints about the thermal evolution of the Earth, um, like and the radioactive content of the Earth. Um, so it's a really, it's an ongoing problem. So, I mean, um, a follow-up to that is what, uh, a really good question, I think, how does the mantle heating by radioactivity affect what's going on? I mean, presumably there's a lot of heat being brought to this by, so it wasn't just gravitational, there's also additional effects that could help continue to drive the dynamo or could slow it down. Is there any thought about how that incorporates into your yeah. model, your picture? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so I, I guess I would rely on that Goldilocks idea that if you have a lot of radioactivity in the mantle, then <clears throat> the mantle is not going to cool the core very fast. 
um, because the mantle's got its all of its own heat it's got to get rid of. And so that would put you in the slow cooling type of planet. But if you have no radioactivity in the mantle, then the mantle maybe just cool the core too quickly because that's the only heat source now driving the thermal evolution of the Earth. So you want to have a little bit of radioactivity to keep that, you know, to keep the mantle hot and convecting for a long enough time um, to cool it sort of moderately. That would be my best guess. We don't yeah. really know. Though. You know, it's interesting because it's it, it, it sounds like it could be very unique because of all these delicate balances of the various <laughs> Another interesting question was, you know, we've heard of, you know, this 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 grand collision that occurred long long the you know along the past of Earth's history. It's speculated, but it's looking more and more like it's true, and maybe even the source of water on Earth. Um, how how might that have affected the dynamo, or how might it have affected the future dynamo, to have a, a major impact of a body which presumably brought a lot of heat to it? At least the impact would have caused a lot of heating. Yeah. I, um... There's the question of whether you need a giant impact um, to get to, to, for the Earth to be as it is today. And this is a little bit outside of my specialty because um, that really gets to how the mantle, how mantle convection works and plate tectonics really yeah. works. Yeah. Um, I would say that, you know, the way I think about the giant impact is that it, it's a pretty safe bet to assume the Earth started in a hot state. Some people like, there, there are ideas out there, believe it or not, that the Earth's inner core is primordial, that the, that the, core, that the Earth accreted so cold that somehow it snuck in a solid piece of iron to the center of the Earth without heating it. And that's a bit extreme. That's very difficult to explain. So the giant impact, if anything, started you out from a very hot state. Yeah. Um, so th going along this line of, of thermal issues, um, uh, what is what is known about how if you look at the current cooling rates and and the dynamo itself and clearly from modeling um how is there a point at which things become solid or become uh where the dynamo dies because ultimately heat gets radiated right or it gets used up in other forms of energy is there a period is there a time at which the earth's magnetic field might die yes yeah that's that's a common question too yeah eventually yeah the answer is yes. Um, if we're talk probably talking in the billion year range, um, because you know, maybe if the, even if the inner core is only six hundred million years old, that's fairly young geologically. Yeah. Um, but it's cool. The cooling rate is decreasing over time. So even if you have it every billion years, you never quite get there. You know. So maybe at some point the core becomes so close to fully solid that there's not enough liquid around to generate strong currents and the magnetic field will just die. You know, and that's probably what happened on Mars. It could have been what happened on Mars and the moon, where it had a liquid core for a bit, the planet cooled too fast, and the core solidified out. For the Earth, it's going to take too long, effectively, because we've got this sticky silicate mantle that doesn't cool all that well. Yeah, yeah. Um... So um, another interesting question here is, it, it, ex let's talk about a few external effects. Does the moon have any, uh, the gravitational effect from the moon have any observable or knowable effect on the dynamo itself? Is that something that, like tidal effects on the oceans? Yeah, it's, um, it's been proposed. I mean, it's expected to some extent, um, but it's probably tiny. Um, folks have been worried about this uh, more with mercury because it experiences stronger tides than yeah. we do from, from um, the moon and the sun. But it turns out that these tidal forcings um, are not very good at driving the kinds of flows you need to generate a magnetic field, which is a bit esoteric comment, but yeah. it turns out that you can these tides can drive flows in stratified fluids um, very well, but not in, uh, they can't generate large scale instabilities, um, at least with the kinds of tidal forcings we expect. So for the earth, we don't think it's important. Folks have proposed it for the moon. Um, but again, it, the, the, the detailed fluid dynamics seem to indicate it's, it's, it's unlikely that that's a big, yeah. plays a big role. So when you say the moon, because of the, the, the substantial gravitational forces of the earth on the moon, 
there might have been effect, and the, and the scale of the moon, there might have been an effect on its dynamo. Yeah, its let me point out. Yeah. yeah, let me point out one more good example here. Io is a moon of Jupiter, and is it's the tidal forces it experiences are so strong that it's continuously got about 100 volcanoes going off on its surface. And Io has no mag internally generating magnetic field, even though we think it has an iron core. Whereas its neighbor orbiting Jupiter, Ganymede, does have a dynamo. And so it could be that tidal forces are better at heating the mantle, like they do on Io, than they are at you know, driving flows in the core to generate a magnetic field. So I would say Io is a good counterexample to that tidal forcing idea. Yeah. Um, so let's move out to the, the our nearby uh, planets nearby here. Um, and of course, their cores are all, some are similar, some are very different in terms of the scale of the core. Of course, the scale of the planet, but also the scale of the core. So, you know, Earth and Venus are, what, about similar in the, in the, in the total percentage of mass that's in the core. And then you have Mars, which might be less. And you've got uh, Mercury, which is much more. Can you tell us a little bit about what the different scales mean, ultimately, in terms of dynamos and, and then maybe even in terms of magnetic fields? Yeah, I think you know, I don't have a I don't have a good quantitative answer, but I would say um, having a big core allows it to retain heat longer. And having a small core, just the opposite. You get rid of that heat faster. Yes. And so this this is why this this fits in nicely with this Goldilocks cooling idea is that Mercury and Earth just are in this zone. And Mercury is a very different planet, obviously, but it's got a big core. Um, and it may be solidifying slowly enough, perhaps because it has a large core, uh, in, in part, that it's it's going on very slowly, and that's generating buoyancy. Whereas with Mars and the Moon, they could be too small. But you know, as we hinted at before, there's a lot of other dials here. There's the radioactivity in the mantle, potential potentially tidally heating, tidal heating in the mantle, which we think to be expect uh, to be much more important in other exoplanets. So I wouldn't say it's just core size, but obviously the core size plays a big role. Yeah. yeah. So, okay, let's move out further to exoplanets. What are the odds that we're actually going to be able to measure magnetic fields with some reliability on, say, the nearest by, if they are, if they do have dynamos, obviously? What are the odds, or how would we actually measure those, those magnetic fields? Yeah, it's a bit of an open question, um, okay. because we expected to find these hot Jupiter dynamos um, with LOFAR. Not we, I'm not part of the team, but people expected to find these when LOFAR launched about five years ago. They have not found them. So um, we don't know exactly why, but it could be that this, some of these stars are much louder in this um, frequency space than we initially thought, which would effectively make the, the planetary mission swamp out the planetary mission. It's like trying to see a dim planet around a bright star. It's like a, it's like a very weak radio signal around a very radio loud star. Right. right. Now, initially, we thought that in this part of the frequency space that the stars would be quiet, but that assumption could not. That, that assumption might be wrong for for other stars, and it could just be our, our type of star. And it could be. It could also be just a detection technique that we have yet to refine of looking at modulations at a different frequency or modeling the space environment. Maybe you need to look at flaring stars to get these kinds of boosts. You need the pole of the planet, the magnetic pole of the planet, to be faced towards the telescope to get this beaming effect. And I think it's helpful if you get a modulation of that beaming effect. So I think there's a lot of variables. And we, needed to, we, need to, we really need to have a lot of targets. It's kind of like the search for exoplanets initially. It's like, we don't really know what we're looking for. So you yeah. really should look kind yeah. of for everything. So I'm optimistic, obviously. I think in 10 years, if we get some of this technology into space, we'll make progress. But um, I certainly think it's worth the investment, and put it that way. Because it's the only way you're going to probe the deep interior of these planets. Yeah. And also coming back to what, what, we, what you had mentioned earlier about habitability and the import, potential importance of magnetic fields for protecting, being a shield against uh, ions on the surface of planets. And, you know, so we could go out, one of the things we are doing is looking at atmospheres, looking for organics maybe in atmospheres. It sounds to me like it would also be very important to understand if they have magnetic fields. So we don't have a lot of time. Let me come back to Earth again and let's talk a little bit about life. I know you're not a biologist, but 
there's a lot of interest here on, on the question of, let's say the surface effects of magnetic fields of these dynamos. A few really interesting ones, but the, 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 the bunch have come in around, of course, life and how big a field is too big, how big, you know, how big a field is too small. Um, you know, of course, life depends on mutations and maybe, maybe some of these cosmic particles or some of the solar wind particles are a cause of those mutations. Too little, as I said, and maybe we wouldn't have evolved too much and we would never probably have evolved because of the destruction to our genetic code. Is, do you have a sense? I mean, is there, is there, are there people out there thinking about what, you know, is there not an ideal field, but is there a range of magnetic fields that you might think are important to maintain? And, and I guess you could say, well, Earth, we just got lucky or we have half a Gauss field, so maybe that's just perfect. Is there any, in, in the stuff you're doing, any thought about that? There's a lot of ideas. There's a lot of us geophysicists coming up with ideas and the biologists disagreeing. And so I, there's yeah. no clear, you know, you see papers all the time on either side of how the magnetic field influences life. Uh, I will say, you know, obviously there's lots of animals out there that have magnetoreceptors, um, birds, right. fish, even cows have magnetoreceptors. And, and so for some of these organisms, the magnetic field was actually very important for them yep. to be able to find their food sources, to be able to move around, um, you know, um, yeah, they birds, migrate, to be able to yep. migrate yep. and so yep. forth. Yep. So um, from that point of view, it's, you know, it's been helpful for some of these life forms. I don't know if it's completely required, obviously, for mammals, but um, I will say it's nice having the poles, the magnetic poles, aligned with rotation poles. Because what that means is that right, all the radiation, all the solar wind particles are being funneled down the magnetic poles into what are least habitable regions of the surface, essentially the Arctic's on the planet. So as long as, as long as you've got that kind of geometric alignment, I think that's probably a good thing. And I can imagine when the mag Earth's magnetic field is reversing, if those yeah. poles become more equatorward, then you'd be exposing mid latitudes in the equator to all kinds of radiation that could be bad. Maybe it's good in the short term because it causes kind of genetic modifications, but bad in the long term, yeah. destabilizing the environment. Yeah, so I think that's, that's about important. as far. As and, I mean, I think it's an important yeah. point that a lot of animals like birds, et cetera, rely on navigation. They rely on the magnetic field, even though it's small. And living on Earth, none of us really notice it on a daily basis. I mean, as a human, at least not apparently notice it. But, you know, this other question about um, which, you know, it's an interesting one, which is what's the what are other surface effects? And so climate's come up in a few of the questions today. Um, you know, the, this idea that, um, you know, that solar storms, the major, not just simple solar wind, solar storms do have an effect on radio waves on Earth. Of course, we know that you can actually have interruption of communications. Um, what's your sense? I mean, is there any, are there any other effects that the magnetic fields have on the surface of Earth, aside from, well, importantly, some of these biological effects? Do we see any of that? Um, I can't think of any off the top of my head. I'm, I'm often asked, what's the influence on climate change? And I'm afraid I don't know of one. There could be the rare event, like you referred to, about a, a giant solar storm, yeah. you know, once in a millennium or once in a million year storm that where we really need our magnetic field for protect, protection because it could ionize the atmosphere or do all kinds of damage um, to the chemical balance in the atmosphere. But I don't think we really know about that yet. I mean, I don't know about that. So yeah. it's a bit good speculation at this point. Yeah. So I think we're almost done. I do want to ask one question, though. If you had, if you could dream about the ideal um, equipment that you would need to look not only at Earth's, I mean, there'll be differences, but Earth, how would you look at the Earth's core? What are the things that you really are missing today in how you measure Earth's inner, the dynamo, basically, the geodynamo? And what would it be, what would make it possible to really have better understanding, given that it's, on observation, it's very hard to drill that deep, isn't it? So how would you actually make observation in a, in a more effective way to give you and your models uh, more validation? Yeah. Um, well, aside from just me being able to refine my own numerical models better. Yeah. Well, you can um, talk about that, what you would need, but also well, more broadly, what, well, what, you, what kind of input yeah. you would need to get it done? 
but I think there are there are a couple other things. Um, um, having much better, much more paleomagnetic data. This is a bit of a dying art. It was popular in the 60s and 70s, and it's become a bit of a niche field, paleomagnetism. And I and I and I that's really disappointing because as I showed you, the record has big gaps in it that could have massive implications for how we understand the Earth. So I'd like to see, and I do see, I do review proposals for NSF, for people to go observe rock, look look for new rocks, but it's, it is, I, I wish there was more energy in that community. Yeah. And the other thing that, that I would dream about would be to have seismic waves that traveled through the inner core from different angles. We're, we're a bit limited to, to magnetic, to earthquake sources and receivers that are in very particular locations on the Earth's surface for geometric reasons, um, and we don't have good coverage. So we don't have good coverage of these the deepest seismic waves over the whole Earth, whole the yeah. whole core, that could infer something about the structure of the core that we don't know something about. Yeah. Uh, maybe I'll finish with one question, which is, um, do we? So you show that the Earth's magnetic field wobbles and moves around, and it's it's not entirely clear what's going on, and it's even weakening. Uh, and as you, I think you also mentioned, the Earth's polar, a, a magnetic dipole has flipped. So it's gone totally from north to south facing um, and it, with a right hand rule, of course. Uh, but um, what wh what are I mean, are we facing a major change in the magnetic field? Is something happening wildly with the the, the um, with the dynamo that we should we should pay attention to? Yeah, that question has triggered some people to do magnetic forecasting, much like we do weather forecasting. Yeah. So they take the, the best magnetic data we have over the last couple hundred years, and they use that as input to numerical models to forecast. And those best forecasts have come back showing that the magnetic field is not going to reverse in the next 50,000 years or so, oh. which is about as far ahead as you can forecast. So that kind of the decrease that we see today in the intensity it's probably a blip on the longer term. Like when you zoom out and you look at the million year time scale, we're not, we're kind of on an uptick. We're coming down off of an uptick. And so um, I don't think we're in trouble of reversing today. Maybe our distant ancestors will have to be concerned with that, but I think we're fine with that. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks, Peter. This is really terrific. And you can see on the screen if you have. Um, if you want to attend future uh, events, we have some really great upcoming events. Uh, this one in particular is a joint thing we do with the Cavalier Institution. So um, please join us. Um, again, let's all thank Peter and do a virtual clap for him. It was really fantastic, Peter. Uh, and if you have any other questions, I tried to get through as many of as I could. I didn't get all of them. Um, but if you have any other questions, please send them to us and we'll try to get them to Peter so he can answer. So thank you, Peter, and thank you to our audience for being uh, for being uh, so inquisitive and, and attentive. Okay, thank you. Bye. Thank you, Peter.